In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, one with Louisa, the little daughter of the Divine Will, I enter into the Holy Divine Will. Come, Divine Will, come beat in my every heartbeat, come breathe in my every breath, come pray, adore, and reign in me. In the name of everyone and everything, past, present, and future. In, with, through, and for Jesus, Mary, and Louisa. In, with, and for all, that all may be for the glory of God and the good of all souls giving to God as if all lived in the most holy divine will. United with creation, redemption, and sanctification, praying as one in that one eternal act. For the kingdom to come, Reign on earth, fiat. Book of Heaven, Volume 14, Part 1. JMJ. My love and my life, guide my hand and be together with me as I write, so that not I, but you, shall do everything. You shall dictate to me the words, that they all may be light of truth. Do not permit that I put anything of myself, but rather let me disappear, so that you yourself may do everything, and the honor and the glory may be all yours. I do this only to obey, and you do not deny me your grace. February 4th, 1922. Love, wandering and rejected, bursts into sobs of crying. As I was in my usual state, my always lovable Jesus made himself seen all panting, his breath was fire, and clasping me to himself, he told me, My daughter, I want refreshment for my flames. I want to pour my love out, but my love is rejected by creatures. You must know that, in creating man, I issued a quantity of love from within my divinity that was to serve as primary life of creatures, for them to be enriched, sustained, fortified, and for help in all their needs. But man rejected this love, and my love has been wandering from the time man was created, and it keeps making its round without ever stopping. Rejected by someone, it runs to someone else in order to give itself, and as it is rejected, it bursts into sobs of crying. So lack of correspondence forms the crying of love. Now, while my love goes wandering and runs to give itself, if it sees someone who is weak, poor, it bursts into sobs of crying and says to him, Ah, if you did not make me go wandering, and had given me a place in your heart, you would have been strong, and you would lack nothing. If it sees someone else fallen into sin, it bursts into sobs, 
Ah, if you had let me enter into your heart, you would not have fallen. For another whom it sees dragged by passions, muddied with earth, love cries, and sobbing it repeats to him, Ah, if you had taken my love, passions would not have life over you, the earth would not touch you, my love would be enough for you in everything. So in each evil of man, small or great, love has a sob of crying and continues to go wandering in order to give itself to man. And when in the garden of Gethsemane all sins presented themselves before my humanity, each sin carried the sob of my love and all the pains of my passion, each blow of the lash, each thorn, each wound, were accompanied by the sob of my love, because if man had loved, no evil would have come. Lack of love germinated all evils, and even my very pains. In creating man, I acted like a king, who, wanting to render his kingdom happy, takes a million and puts it in circulation, so that whoever wants it may take of it. But as much as it circulates, only a few take a few cents. Now the king is anxious to know whether the peoples are taking the good he wants to do to them, and he asks whether his million is finished, so as to put out more millions. But he is answered, Majesty, just a few cents. The king feels sorrow in hearing that his people are not receiving his gifts, nor do they appreciate them. So going out into the midst of his subjects, he begins to see some covered with rags, some infirm, some starving, some shivering with cold, some homeless. And in his sorrow, the king bursts into sobs of crying and says, Ah, had they taken my money, I would see no one giving me dishonor, covered with rags, but rather well-dressed. Nor would I see them infirm, but healthy. I would see no one starving and almost dead from hunger, but full. Had they taken my money, no one would be homeless. They could very well have built themselves a room in which to take shelter. In sum, for each misfortune he sees in his kingdom, he has a sorrow, a tear, and he grieves over his million, which the ingratitude of the people rejects. But the goodness of this king is so great that in spite of such great ingratitude, he does not withdraw this million. He lets it continue to circulate, hoping that other generations may take the good that others have rejected, and so he may receive the glory of the good he has done to his kingdom. So I do. My love that has come out, I shall not withdraw. It shall continue to go wandering. Its sobbing shall last still until it finds souls who would take this love of mine down to the last penny so that my crying may cease and I may receive the glory of the dowry of the love that I have issued for the good of creatures. But do you know who the fortunate ones are who shall make the sobbing of my love cease? the souls who shall live in my will. They shall take all the love rejected by the other generations. With the power of my creative will, they shall multiply it as much as they want, and for as many creatures as have rejected it from me. Then shall its sobbing cease, and the sob of joy shall take its place, and love, satisfied, 
shall give to these fortunate ones all the goods and the happiness that others did not want. February 9th, 1922. The tortured body of Jesus is the true portrait of the man who commits sin. In the scourging, Jesus lets his flesh be torn to shreds. He reduced all of himself to a wound in order to give life back to man again. Finding myself in my usual state, I was following the hours of the Passion. And while I was accompanying my sweet Jesus in the mystery of his painful scourging, he made himself seen with his flesh all torn up. His body was stripped, not only of his garments, but also of his flesh. His bones could be counted one by one. His appearance was not only harrowing, but horrible to the sight, such as to strike fear, fright, reverence, and love at the same time. I felt mute before a scene so harrowing. I would have wanted to do who knows what to relieve my Jesus, but I could do nothing. And the sight of his pains gave me death. And Jesus, all goodness, told me, My beloved daughter, look well at me, that you may know my pains in depth. My body is the true portrait of the man who commits sin. Sin strips him of the garments of my grace, and I, in order to give it back again, let myself be stripped of my garments. Sin deforms him, and while he is the most beautiful creature that came out of my hands, he renders himself the ugliest, disgusting and repugnant. I was the most beautiful of men, and in order to give beauty back to man, I can say that my humanity took on the ugliest form. Look at me, how horrid I am. I let my skin be torn off by dint of lashes, to the point that I could no longer recognize myself. Not only does sin take beauty away, but it forms deep wounds, rotten and gangrenous, that corrode the most intimate parts. They consume his vital humors, so everything he does are dead works, skeletal. They snatch from him the nobility of his origin, the light of his reason, and he becomes blind. And I, in order to fill the depth of his wounds, let my flesh be torn to shreds. I reduced all of myself to a wound, and by shedding blood in rivers, I made the vital humors flow in his soul, so as to give life back to him again. Ah, had I not had the font of the life of my divinity within me, that has my humanity died at each pain that they gave me, substituted my life, I would have died from the very beginning of my passion. Now my pains, my blood, my flesh that fell off in shreds, are always in act of giving life to man. But man rejects my blood, so as not to receive life. He tramples my flesh, so as to remain wounded. Oh, how I feel the weight of ingratitude. And throwing himself into my arms, he burst into tears. I clasped him to my heart, but he was crying strongly. What torment to see Jesus crying. I would have wanted to suffer any pain 
so that he would not cry. So I compassionated him. I kissed his wounds. I dried his tears. And he, as though cheered, added, Do you know how I act? Like a father who loves his son very much, and the son is blind, deformed, crippled. And the father who loves him to folly, what does he do? He plucks out his own eyes. He tears off his own legs, tears his own skin off, and he gives them to his son, saying, I am happier to remain blind, crippled, deformed myself, as long as I see you, my son, seeing, walking, being beautiful. Oh, how happy is that father in seeing his son look with his eyes, walk with his legs, and covered with his beauty. But what would the sorrow of the father be if he saw that his son, ungrateful, throws away his eyes, legs, and skin, contenting himself with remaining ugly as he is? So I am. I took care of everything. But men, ungrateful, form my most bitter sorrow. February 14, 1922 The Contentment of Jesus When One Writes About Him As I was in my usual state, my sweet Jesus made himself seen all pleased and with an indescribable contentment. And I said to him, What is it, Jesus? Are you bringing me good news that you are so content? And Jesus, my daughter, do you know why I am so content? All my joy, my feast, is when I see you right. I see, being inscribed in those written words, my glory, my life, the knowledge of me that multiplies more and more. The light of the divinity, the power of my will, the outpouring of my love. I see them written on paper, and in each word I feel the fragrance of all my perfumes. Then I see those written words run, run into the midst of the peoples, to bring new knowledges, my outpouring love, and the secret of my will. Oh, how I rejoice to the point that I don't know what I would do to you when you write. And as you write new things of what regards me, I keep inventing new favors in order to repay you. And I dispose myself to tell you new truths so as to give you new favors. I have always loved more and reserved greater graces for those who have written about me, because they are the continuation of my evangelical life, the spokesman of my word. And what I did not say in my gospel, I intended to say to those who would write about me. I did not finish preaching then. I must preach always, for as long as the generations shall exist. And I, my love, to write the truths that you tell me is a sacrifice. But the sacrifice is felt as harder, and I almost feel no strength to do it. When I am obligated, and they force me to write of my intimacies between you and me, and of what regards me, to the point that I don't know what I would do in order not to put the pen on paper. And Jesus... You remain always aside. It is always about me that you speak. What I do to you, the love I have for you, and where my love toward creatures reaches. This shall push others to love me, so that they too may receive the good that I do to you. 
And besides, this mixing you and me in writing is also necessary. Otherwise someone might say, To whom did he say this? With whom was he so generous in lavishing his favors? Perhaps to the wind? To the air? Is it not said that in my life I was so very generous with my mamma? That I spoke to the apostles? To the crowds? And that I healed such and such sick person? Therefore, everything is necessary, and be sure that, whatever you write, it is always me that you make known more. February 17, 1922 Love is the Cradle of Man I felt oppressed because of the privation of my sweet Jesus, and I did nothing but call him desire him, but in vain. Then, after I struggled very much, when I could take no more, he came. Who knows how many things I wanted to tell him, but he rose up high without giving me time, and I looked at him and called him, Jesus, Jesus, come. He too looked at me, and he poured a dew upon me from his person that pearled me all over. And this dew drew him toward me in such a way that he lowered himself toward me and told me, My daughter, the desire of the soul of wanting to see me tears the veil that exists between time and eternity. And the repeated desire gives her the flight to come closer to me my love is almost restless when I see that the soul wants me and I do not make myself seen. And only then does it calm down when I not only make myself seen, but I give her new charisms and new pledges of love. My love is always an act of wanting to give new pledges of love to the creature. And as soon as it sees that my will takes the operating and directing role of giving itself to the creature, my love makes feast. It runs. It flies toward her and makes itself cradle of man. And if it sees that she does not rest in its cradle, it rocks her. It sings for her to make her rest and sleep on its lap. And while she sleeps, it breathes into her mouth to give her new life of love. If it sees from her interrupted breath that her heart is not happy, with the breath that it sends to her, my love forms for her the cradle in her heart to take away from her the bitternesses, the hindrances, the bothers, and make her happy with love. And when she wakes up, Oh, how my love rejoices in seeing her reborn, happy and full of life. And it says to her, See, I rocked you on my lap to give you rest. I kept vigil at your side during your sleep, so that you might wake up strong, happy, and completely different from the one you were. Now I want to be cradle for your steps, for your works, for your words, for everything. Think that you are being rocked by me and place your love in the cradle of my love so that, identifying ourselves with each other, we may make each other happy. Be careful not to put anything else. Otherwise you shall sadden me and shall make me cry bitterly. It is my love that comes closest to man. Even more, it is the cradle in which he was born. Although everything is harmony in my divinity, just as the members are in full harmony with the body. Even though the intelligence takes the directing role in which the will of man resides, if he does not want it, one can say that the eye does not see, 
The hand does not operate. The foot does not walk. On the other hand, if he wants, the eye sees. The hand operates. The foot runs. All the members place themselves in accord. The same with my divinity. My will takes the directing role, and all the other attributes place themselves in full harmony to follow what my will wants. So wisdom, power, science, goodness, and so forth, concur. And since all of my attributes, although distinct among themselves, live in the font of love, overflow with love, here is why, while it is love that runs, that acts, that gives itself, all my other attributes concur together with it. Furthermore, what is most necessary to man is love. Love is like bread for the natural life, so one can do without science, power, wisdom, or at most, these are things that are wanted in time and circumstance. But what would one say if I had created man and did not love him? And besides, why create him if I were not to love him? And this would be a dishonor for me, and a work unworthy of me, who can do nothing other than love. And what would happen to man if he did not have an origin of love and could not love? He would be a brute, and unworthy even to be looked at. Therefore, love must run in everything. Love should run in all the human actions, just as the image of the king circulates in the currency of a kingdom. And if the currency is not marked by the image of the king, it is not recognized as money. In the same way, if love does not run within a work, it is not recognized as my work. February 21st, 1922. The nature of true love is to die and live continuously for the beloved. Continuing in my usual state, my always adorable Jesus, on coming, told me, My daughter, my love toward the creature made me die at each instant. The nature of true love is to die and live continuously for the beloved. The love of wanting her with oneself makes one feel death. It causes a martyrdom, perhaps of the most painful and prolonged. However, the same love, stronger than death itself, in the very instant in which one dies, gives him life. But to do what? To give life to the beloved and form one single life with her. Those flames have the virtue of consuming one life to fuse it within the other. This is precisely the virtue of my love, to make me die and, from my consummation, form many seeds, to place them in the hearts of all creatures, so as to make me rise again and form with them one single life with me. Now you too can die, who knows how many times for love of me, and maybe at each instant. Every time you want me and do not see me, your will feels the death of my privation, and it does so in reality, because as you do not see me, your will dies, for it does not find the life it seeks. However, after it has consumed itself in that act, I am reborn in you, and you in me, and you find again the life wanted by you. But to return to die once again, in order to live in me. In the same way, if you desire me, your desire, 
unquenched feels death. But as I make myself seen, it finds its life again. The same with your love, your intelligence, your heart. They can be in continuous act of dying and living for me. If I have done this for you, it is quite right that you do it for me. February 24th, 1922. The cross that is suffered in the will of God becomes similar to the cross of Jesus. As I was in my usual state, my always adorable Jesus made himself seen in the act of taking up the cross and placing it on his most holy shoulders. And he told me, My daughter, when I received the cross, I looked at it from top to bottom to see the place that each soul would take in my cross. And among many, I looked with more love and I placed a more special attention for those who would be resigned and would live life in my will. I looked at them, and I saw their cross, long and large, just as mine, because my will made up for what their cross lacked, making it longer and larger like mine. Oh, how your long cross stood out, long from so many years of bed, suffered only to fulfill my will. My cross was there only to fulfill the will of my celestial Father, and yours to fulfill my will. One gave honor to the other, and since both of them had the same measure, they blended together. Now, my will has the virtue of softening hardness, of sweetening bitterness, of extending and enlarging short things. So when I felt the cross upon my shoulders, I felt the softness, the sweetness, of the cross of the souls who would suffer in my will. Ah, oh, my heart heaved a sigh of relief, and the softness of the crosses of these souls made the cross adapt to my shoulders, sinking so deep as to give me a deep wound. And although it gave me sharp pain, I also felt the softness and the sweetness of the souls who would suffer in my will. And since my will is eternal, their suffering, their reparations, their acts, ran within each drop of my blood, in each wound, in each offense. My will made them be as though present at the offenses of the past, from the moment the first man sinned, at the present, and at the future offenses. They were the ones who returned to me the rights of my will, and I, for love of them, decreed redemption. And if others enter into it, it is because of these souls that they partake in it, there is no good that I concede, either in heaven or on earth, that is not because of them. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 14, Part 1. Fiat. Dearest Lord Jesus, I thank you for your lessons of today. Free me from living one single instant outside of your will. Have pity on me and do not permit that I either know or acquire any other life except that of your divine will. Fiat et amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.